Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here with Zach Burton. He's a very, very good friend. Um, and as a good friend, of course, I have to say nice things about your book. <laughs> but I was not expecting to be sitting in the closet in the middle of the night with a nightlight not being able to put it down. Um, I know you're a great storyteller. I've been to a few dinner parties, but um, this far exceeded my expectations. I encourage you all not to leave without it. It's a page turner. Zach, thank you again for joining us. <laughs> thank you. It's nice to see a whole bunch of familiar and unexpected faces, including some of my family here who's right in the front row, <laughs> who, who are originally from a place called Breckenridge, Minnesota, where I just checked, and it's 185 degrees below zero there <laughs> right now. So glad to have them there. And uh, look at this big crowd. I love it. This is like, um, I, think this, I think this matches Trump's inauguration crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for, to come to San Francisco to tell that one. Um, so I thought before we start our discussion, um, I wanted to give everyone a flavor of your beautiful, beautiful writing and storytelling. Um, so I'm going to hand you the book and ask you to read uh, something for us. And hold the microphone at the same time. <laughs> Do your best. Um, this is a very short passage. Um, uh, about a young man named Kong, um, who I met on my very first trip to South Sudan um, a little more than 10 years ago, and uh, who we'll talk about a little more. Um, so this is from the last chapter from a place called Wat in South Sudan in June of 2016. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. The giant rotor blades of the Ukrainian-built Mi-8 helicopter turn faster and faster overhead until the whooshing turns into a high-pitched hum. The silver-haired man in the tan jumpsuit hands me a set of noise-canceling headphones. Like the other members of his flight crew, he sports a buzz cut and a gold necklace, and his uniform is clean and well-fitted. His movements are nonchalant, but they do not disguise the seriousness and honor with which he does his job. Piloting is a prestigious profession back home in Ukraine, and these guys have been around the block. The MI-8 is a military transport helicopter by design. Its rudimentary metal benches and clunky seatbelt buckles are meant to accommodate two dozen soldiers, and its rear cargo bay could hold a small car. But this chopper has been painted white and emblazoned with two giant black yet letters, UN for the United Nations. At rest, its rotor blades, spanning 70 feet from end to end, droop nearly halfway to the tarmac. But now, they are straight and ripping through the air, creating a strobe light effect inside the cabin. I feel the rotor reach top speed and put on the headset as air rushes through the portholes. The MI-8 stretches itself upright and lifts gently off the tarmac. The pilot then dips its nose aggressively and thrusts forward and up. Leaving Juba Airport behind, we head north, the flying behemoth lifting higher and higher. Fading away are the heat and dust and smells of the street, the sweet stench of rubbish, the frying mandazi, the choking vehicle exhaust. Gone too, as we ascend, are the hum of diesel fuel generators, honking horns, and the shouting Boda Boda boys. The bustle and sweat and confines of urban life give way to nature and to the vast and untouched expanses that blanket this country. Beige and brown and black are replaced by a spectrum of green, emerald, hunter, lime. A giant feathered quill has scripted the River Nile like calligraphy on a boundless green parchment its waters bending and curving infinitely into the distance. Below, there are no more buildings, no settlements, and no roads. Solid earth gives way to marshland, and two giant white birds cut a diagonal flight path ac across the impressive color wheel below. And to our left, the chocolate-colored mountains are silhouetted in the afternoon haze. This ascent never gets old. The two southern Sudanese men their foreheads on the windows next to me are likewise transfixed by the awesome beauty below. Also fading away are the messy politics of conflict, the angst and the arguments and divisions that have enveloped the capital city behind us. We're humming north along the eastern bank of the river toward Wat, farther and farther from the warped politics of Juba that are too often mistaken to represent the whole of South Sudan. I've decided to go and visit Kong a young man I met seven years earlier when we were both in our late 20s, 
I haven't spoken with him since, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Kong has come of age in the interim, and I'm confident he'll offer a different perspective of where his country has been and where it is going. What an adventure, Zach. Thank you for, for painting that picture for us. Um, first things first, I love the title, A Rope from the Sky. I presume there's a story behind it. Do tell. Uh, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful story. In the, in the Nilotic folk tales of South Sudan, the earth and the sky were once linked by a rope. And that meant that the South Sudanese people could travel up and down that rope. And they would have access to the gods and to heavens and to, the, uh, to eternal life. Um, but tragically, on account of human error, uh, that rope is severed at one point. And it means that the people are forever resigned uh, to the difficulties and suffering and mortality that is the human condition. Um, and I thought, in some ways, sadly, um, that parable is appropriate for this book and for this larger story, um, which is also one of Paradise Lost. So I think this is a very important story to tell, and I've been captivated by it. But why did you decide to write the book? It's an endeavor. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I learned a lot along the way. Um, Look, I think Sudan is, uh, for many people, and I write about this in the opening of the book, um, a faraway place. Um, one that's you know, hard to make sense of for a lot of people, one that's hard to identify yet with. And yet, because of its history, it registers widely in popular consciousness. You know, whether or not that's uh, the lost boys of Sudan who escaped uh, the war and conflict and who uh, went through incredible circumstances to come and settle in towns and cities all across the United States uh, and Canada. Um, maybe it's Darfur and the popular campaign to stop the war in Darfur. Um, or maybe it's simply the words George Clooney. Um, I, I, see, I see some of you um, who, who people know was all involved in activism. But um, for me, I didn't think that this remarkable story of South Sudan's uh, birth, the story that split Africa's largest country in half, um, uh, had really been sufficiently told. And so from South Sudan's long liberation struggle uh, to this euphoric high of independence uh, to sadly its collapse just two years later, um, I think it's a remarkable story. Um, so first I hope it's a story about um, South Sudanese and told through many of their characters um, about hope and liberation and uh, survival and um, hopefully also about redemption. Um, but secondly, the second part to that is that it's also a story about the United States. Um, it's, it's this unbelievable coalition um, that comes together, uh, kind of unprecedented, uh, to back the South Sudanese cause that includes uh, the Christian right uh, across the Bible Belt and, 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 and Republicans in Congress and the Hollywood left and the sort of Congressional Black Congress caucus in Congress. So um, it's really a remarkable story and one both about America, I think, at its best uh, and at its worst. We need all night. <laughs> this is going to take a while. Um, but before we dive into a lot of this, I want to give the basics for the audience. So tell us what happened in Sudan and South Sudan that brought us here today. I thought you were going to give the basics. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know more than I do. Go ahead. Um, Okay, sure. So just a few, for those that aren't familiar, a few uh, points on the calendar to think of. Um, first is uh, Sudan. This is the largest country in Africa. And for, for those that don't know, it's large. Uh, um, Sudan, as it, in its former self, is roughly equivalent to the eastern half of the United States, sort of east of the Mississippi. So it's big. Um, and uh, so... It's at war uh, between the mid-1980s and 2005, a really vicious war between um, governments in the center and many of the country's peripheries, uh, both Darfur but also South Sudan. Um, and we can talk about some of the simplifications of that narrative. Um, so 2005 is the first date to think of. That is when this awful war ends and the, there's a role the United States plays. And after that, there's a six-year trial period. A sort of uh, Sudan's north and south, the simplified, are, are going to continue dating. And at the end of that period, they're going to decide whether gonna, uh, they will continue in union or whether South Sudan will opt for independence. Um, so that date comes in 2011. Um, and as you've probably put together already, um, South Sudan does choose or opt for independence. To the tune of 99% of uh, eligible voters uh, vote to 
uh, secede, to determine their own political destiny and to create a country in South Sudan. Um, I think the last date to remember here, um, sadly, is 2013. So just two years later, um, after the whole world had watched its eyes on South Sudan and, and a new flag went up in 2011 and Barack Obama declared that the map of the world had been redrawn, um, really just two years later, a little more, in December of 2013, um, a new civil war engulfs South Sudan. Um, and that's kind of the narrative arc of the book and I hope will orient you a little bit. I love the way you start off the book because it draws it in immediately to the human human aspect of all of these policy decisions. So you have a pretty substantial prologue which frames the whole narrative. So tell us about Simon, the young man who we met meet in the very first pages. Yeah. So Simon is a young man from a place called Okobo on the eastern part of South Sudan, and he's from the ethnic Nuer tribe. So South Sudan has 60-odd tribes, and the Nuer and the Dinka are, are the two, two of the biggest. Um, and Simon has grown up abroad in neighboring Kenya, uh, like so many others uh, like him who were displaced during the war. Um, but in 2011, he comes back. He comes back to South Sudan, um, excited by the promise of a new beginning. Um, and we meet him on the night of December 15th, 2013. And this is the night the violence begins. And so we meet Simon in his shack on the north side of Juba, and he's about to go to sleep and he hears gunfire in the distance. And over the course of the night, that gunfire increases and it comes closer and closer. And over the next 36 hours, it gives way to heavy machine guns and to tanks. And Simon knows that he's not going to school the next day. Um, and that night, um, he makes a choice uh, because there are uh, members of the government's uh, military that are out, uh, members largely of the Dinka community that are hunting members of his tribe. Right? There are kill squads coming uh, all across uh, Juba and targeting both uh, combatants but also women and children. And so Simon is forced to uh, make a run for it. And he decides to try and make it to the camp uh, of the United Nations peacekeeping mission that's already in South Sudan. And I won't tell you the whole story here, but um, Simon, it's a pretty harrowing journey. And Simon comes within inches of his life. Um, and when he arrives at the camp, um, there are thousands of other South Sudanese like him already knocking on the doors uh, trying to seek refuge. Um, and from there, we sort of rewind two years. Um, there's a that, that deal. Uh, we rewind two years to 2011, and it's July the 9th, that day the whole world is watching, and Simon wakes up early, and he puts on his new suit that his brother bought him, and he puts on a new tie, and he meets up with his friends, and he boogies his way down to Freedom Square in Juba, where there are hundreds of thousands of citizens in waiting uh, there to celebrate South Sudan's coming out party. Right, and so uh, the new flag goes up, and Simon dances, and he sings, and he yells, South Sudan, oye, and everyone responds, and it's, a, it's an incredible day. I was uh, lucky to be one witness among many there. Um, but Simon listens to the words of his leaders uh, that day, and his expectations swell. Um, and so right up front on the story, as you mentioned, we have, um, I think, the kind of full narrative arc, the, the high this euphoric high of independence and this really devastating uh, tragedy that follows so soon after. Uh, and from there, we, we rewind and try to unpack um, just how the hell this happened. So what I really love about the book is that you do tell the story through the lens of a host of characters from South Sudan's big men, and that's every man. So tell us about that decision. To use characters. Yes, to tell this story through these characters. Uh, they're more interesting than me. Um, and it's their story, really. Um, so, as you say, we meet both the big man and the everyman. We meet uh, a man called Dr. John Garang, who is in many ways is the father of, uh, of, of South Sudan and who's this lionized figure in South Sudan's history and has incredible charisma and is the one that really comes and builds a special re relationship with the United States. And he's a remarkable figure and has a remarkable vision for the future. We should, we should come back to that point. Um, we meet Salva Kiir, uh, President Salva Kiir. If you've seen up here these photos or elsewhere, the man in the big black cowboy hat, um, which was a gift from President George W. Bush. Uh, we meet Salva Kiir, who is the sort of accidental president, is the chapter in the book, um, who's thrust into the presidency at this moment of existential crisis for uh, 
South Sudan. Um, we meet in some ways uh, an arch nemesis, uh, Riak Mashar, um, and the chapter about him is called Rebel with a PhD. Um, whether you love him or hate him, nobody, everyone has strong feelings about Riak. And so we, we meet all these big men who um, animate South Sudan's, uh, this, this modern political history and, and in many ways um, animate it for too long, I would argue. Um, but we also meet the every man and the every woman. So um, we meet a young woman called Ayen, who uh, during Sudan's long civil war is displaced from the south, and she's ethnically from uh, southern Sudanese, and she goes of all places to the north. She goes to Khartoum, and she uh, gets married, and she has children, and she has a job, and she sets up a life there, and she's there for 20 years. Um, and much like Simon, um, in 2011, when uh, South Sudan is finally going to step out onto the world stage and form its own state, she too is excited. And she goes on this really remarkable journey. She sells everything she owns, she packs up her children, and she gets on a bus to go south. And she gets on another bus to go south. And then she gets on a barge and goes up the River Nile for two weeks uh, to go home and vote in the referendum. Um, and, and all this time, she's bringing uh, this group of children home uh, to a country they've never set foot in. Um, so we meet Ayen, um, we meet a young man called Dwap, um, who takes us inside a really sacred space in South Sudan, the cattle camp, um, where many young men and women come of age. Um, we meet a, an ex-banker called James. Um, for those of you that follow South Sudan, corruption is uh, one of the cancers that really um, really ate at the state even before it was born. And after the war and after things come unraveled in South Sudan, um, I sit down with James and the sort of code of silence that has uh, governed uh, corruption in South Sudan is lifted. This kind of omerta is gone. Uh, and James helps us understand both the scope of corruption in South Sudan, um, but also the motivations. And, and I hope in this chapter um, uh, you will wrestle with characters like James, um, and in, in that case, when it comes to corruption, um, I hope the, the moral choices aren't as black and white as you might think. Um, so I, I hope that they uh, help to tell the larger story, um, and they, a lot of them appear throughout the book. Um, yes, George Clooney makes a cameo, uh, as does Barack Obama and the Pope and lots of others, but uh, lots of characters. Uh, let's talk about you, Zach. Um, <laughs> no you know, you, you kind of come into pa this. Pass. <laughs> Uh, I, I know you're trying to be humble and behind the scenes, but you do show up in the book as a narrator. And, and you introduce us to this place in your experience. Um, and I know you when you were writing this book and you really struggled with that decision. So how did, that, how did you decide on what to do? Um, yeah, so for those of you that w follow closely, you can maybe identify the three or four chapters I wrote without ever using the word I when I started. Um, I was totally mortified. Um, I'd never written anything like this. I'd done a lot of foreign policy writing. Um, it isn't my story. Uh, so I was mortified about using the word I. Um, but I went to a writing residence, a kind of writer's camp in upstate New York uh, with a bunch of other authors and journalists and um, started to wrestle with the material for this book. And I raised this issue and they all told me I was nuts. Um, and said, look, you were there, you know, accidentally, uh, before, during, and after independence. Um, why are you trying to uh, pretend as if you weren't. Uh, and one of them importantly said that um, I doesn't have to mean me. And uh, maybe that's evident to some writers in the room, but it wasn't to me. Uh, but that really opened it up. Um, and so I hope I show up as a narrator, as a set of eyes, um, uh, but as I and not as me. Um, so we do get uh, a lot of, I think, colorful vignettes, formative experiences for me, um, but I think that are entry points uh, to highlight some of the larger themes uh, that run throughout this book and this story. Well, I loved it, and I loved uh, thinking about what that must have felt like at certain moments, and one of my favorites is a little lighthearted but so poignant about playing basketball with some of the young hot shots. So just tell us about that scene. Um, hmm. So basketball is another way that um, many people who don't follow this know South Sudan, or they know Sudan. Um, many of, or, or some of South Sudan's sort of leading lights have played at the highest levels of uh, professional basketball. Uh, one of whom, a guy called Luol Deng, who um, now plays for uh, 
my own team, the Minnesota Timberwolves, I actually talked to last week and is, and appears in the book. Um, but there's a, there is a scene in Juba where um, I'm playing basketball, and uh, this was one of the few ways to get exercise in Juba at the time, and I'm going to level with you. I played high school basketball in a town of 3,000 in, in rural Minnesota. So I had, as the coach there uh, you know, generously said, he, he liked me to play with these guys, these young 16- and 17-year-old South Sudanese, because I had good fundamentals, which, in case you don't know, is a nice way of saying you can't jump. Um, but... I had this wonderful time playing basketball with these with these guys on a number of occasions, um, and I think basketball is one of these things that um, says a little bit about South Sudan, um, past, present, and future. Um, when somebody like Luol Deng um, comes home to South Sudan, um, these young kids, all of these kids on that court that day, they know his every stat. They know how many points he scored in the All-Star game and when he played in the Olympics and who he's been traded to and all of these things. And they don't care at all where he's from. They don't care about his ethnic group. They don't care about his family or his background. And so these, um, these divisive issues that have so shredded South Sudanese society, um, both in, during the war and, and, uh, and since, begin to fall away. And, and these young men and women um, attach themselves to something larger. And so uh, I think it's an entry point. It's a, it's a comical story um, at my expense about um, these, this larger issue of, of what basketball and other things like it can do and, and about social reconciliation, really. Sports is the answer to world peace. <laughs> um, tell us about Su South Sudan as a country at that moment of independence. What was it at that moment and what challenges did it face? Yeah, so it's a project, um, right? And I think this is ultimately one of the problems that South Sudan, had, at independence from its, its international partners, um, Independence Day is mistaken as the finish line rather than the starting block. I'm continuing with your sports, sports <laughs> metaphors there. Um, <clears throat> South Sudan, for those of you who don't know it, um, imagine the most underdeveloped place you can think of and then multiply. So at the... At, you know, in 2011, there are no uh, institutions in South Sudan. There's no sense of yet what it means to be a nation. Um, really, the great unifying force in South Sudan up to that point had been their collective opposition to the north, right? If you look at health indicators or water or education, uh, north of 75% illiterate, really. So it's really at the bottom of global, global indices when it comes to uh, development. When I arrived there in um, 2009, um, 2008. Um, this is a country roughly the size of France, South Sudan itself, and there's less than 50 kilometers of paved roads at the time. So, Which it ma what makes it the most expensive place to deliver aid in the world. That's also true. That's right. So it's really a huge uh, task. Um, they have to build institutions. They have to forge uh, a nation, which in some ways I, I talk about in the book is harder than forging a state. Um, and remember, one piece of context here, um, South Sudan has just separated from the north. And it turns out that separating a country um, is pretty difficult business. So when it comes to oil and security and currency and nationality um, and all these complex issues, um, even at independence, uh, that process is not complete. So there is still, in many ways, this very complicated, uh, very messy divorce uh, still going on at a time when South Sudan, um, uh, in order to make a state, to make a go of it, needs all hands on deck. We were so optimistic, but not realistic. So. So the revered liberation fighters in South Sudan, the SPLM, rather than living up to the democratic ideals for which they fought, we, in, we instead watched them rig elections, suppress dissent, and crack down on any of their fellow Southern Sudanese who objected. Why and why do you think they failed? Um. Yeah, so a bit of context here. The, the SPLM, the Sudan People's Liberation Movement, is the, is the, are the guerrilla fighters, the liberation fighters in South Sudan have, have been fighting for uh, independence or for self-determination. Um, they're one of the fighting forces in South Sudan, by the way. Um, and they, this is the group that really establishes a relationship with Washington and with uh, many other constituencies all across the United States. Um, a lot of that is for South Sudan, but in particular, it's for 
um, the SPLM. So with that context, um, they did. They were arguing to leave Sudan um, because they wanted to create a new Sudan. They wanted to create something different. They wanted to create a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, uh, multi-party inclusive democracy in South Sudan, the things that they had um, so long been denied. Um, and they failed. Um, and uh, they failed, and I think there's, we, we can talk about this, but I think there's a role for um, foreign partners here um, in that issue as well. But that's a long lead in to say that this book is one part political autopsy. Um, and I think that uh, an appropriate autopsy in South Sudan doesn't begin in 2013 when the violence begins, and it doesn't begin in 2011 at independence or even at the end of the war. I think you have to go back into the 80s and 90s and really understand um, the movement itself um, to understand how we got to where we are. Um, and so I go back to South Sudan in, in 2016 and, and sit down with uh, many of the SPLM's leading men. And uh, unfortunately, they are mostly men. Um, I also sit down with their most ardent critics um, and also ordinary Sudanese and ask uh, sort of how, why the SPLM failed. And I won't go into the uh, full details here, but I'll preview three answers. Um, one is the ethos of the movement. Um, so Dr. John Garang comes to the United States and wins over constituencies in the West, um, but what people don't really understand what's happening inside the movement and that um, John Garang has perhaps overlearned the lessons of failed liberation movements past and he keeps uh, this movement um, in his sort of an iron fist. It's really a one man, uh, he's running the whole show and they're not building up the kind of democratic structures um, that were needed, many would argue, maybe with the benefit of hindsight now, uh, to build a nation. Um, and unfortunately, spoiler alert, um, Dr. John Garang dies um, in a tragic uh, accident right, at, right um, at a critical moment. And uh, when he dies, uh, many, a, a lot of that vision dies with him. Um, so second is a lack of a meaningful connection um, with ordinary South Sudanese. So for those of you that study liberation movements and have looked at this elsewhere in Africa and elsewhere in the world, um, you see liberation movements providing for their people, providing food, providing security, in some cases even uh, setting up clinics or providing services. Um, and in many ways, um, uh, the SPLM at times is a predatory movement. Uh, and it's preying on people, and it's taking food, and it's taking children to fight in the war. Um, and it reflects the fact that um, the divisions in, in South Sudan, um, there are more divisions than it looks like from the outside. And this isn't simply a war between North and South, as is too often characterized. Um, but it's a really complicated set of issues. Um, the third issue, um, I always forget this one, Department of Energy, no. Um, <laughs> Uh, third, uh, party factionalism. The third issue is party factionalism. So in the wake of John Garang's death, um, again, largely unseen to those outside, its foreign friends and foreign supporters, um, a really vicious battle begins uh, for the throne to sort of uh, to become the heir of, of John, Dr. John Garang's movement. And as I said, this is a time when all hands are needed on deck to make South Sudan go, and instead this kind of top tier of political elites um, is consumed uh, by a power struggle. And it's ultimately that power struggle that leads in 2013 uh, to the war. Um, you may, for those of you that have followed or read about it, it's, it's very often characterized as an ethnic war uh, between uh, the Dinka tribe and the New Era, and that's absolutely the case, and that absolutely happened after the fact, but that is not how it started. It started as a political battle among a group of, uh, many would say, disconnected elites. And when uh, it broke down, there weren't the institutions in place to absorb that, and so it turned violent. And um, these leaders sort of summoned the ghosts of a pretty troubled ethnic past, uh, and it turned into an ethnic war. Um, so the, there is uh, a pretty extensive autopsy that runs throughout the book that deals with both the SPLM itself, um, but also with its uh, partners on the outside. There's some critique in this book of the US and other Western governments and their, their relationship with the SPLM, which this definitely was the most interesting part of the book for me. What did we in the United States get wrong? Well, I'm gonna sum that up. Um, so first and foremost, let me say the, the important part. The, 
the United States in particular played an extraordinary role in South Sudan, and it was a righteous cause. And it helped deliver food aid to um, people that were suffering from famine. It helped end a war that the South Sudanese were having trouble ending on their own. And it, and it helped deliver uh, the South Sudan this euphoric day and this opportunity to define their own destiny after generations and generations of repression uh, and neglect. So that's most important and upfront. Um, th this is a, a sub theme that runs throughout the book. And it's one of the reasons, per your earlier questions, that I decided to write the book, because I don't think we're very good at lessons learned. Um, and we're particularly not very good at lessons learned um, when it comes to Africa. And, and so I hope that this book, uh, and, and part of this critique, um, is one small contribution to a conversation I think we should be having. And I, uh, I don't think it comes across as finger pointing. That's not really my aim, and that's not really, I don't think, how the book unfolds, but more about what are the lessons we can all learn, myself included, uh, from the South Sudanese, the experiment in South Sudan and how it applies, uh, whether to Yemen or to Syria uh, or to other places. Um, all that said, um, the critique itself, um, there's a chapter, um, chapter 22, called Love Lost, uh, which after dec decades of this relationship, uh, the relationship uh, comes apart. And the epigraph um, of that chapter is from a guy who is one of America's biggest champions, or one of the SPLM's biggest champions in America, and it really helped um, create this huge moment of support. And I sat down with him for a series of conversations in 2016 and 2017, and he said, um, you know, you can become very close to someone, but still be a tough friend. And we were never a tough friend. Um, and I think that really sums it up. Um, you know, so this relationship was incredibly important, but over time, I think, um, a simplified narrative about the war in Sudan, um, a kind of unqualified belief in the righteousness of the cause, uh, and a compulsion to act, I think, together uh, led to uh, a kind of uncritical embrace in South Sudan. And it warps the political space, both in Washington and, and in South Sudan. And it contributes to a relationship with this SPLM elite, who are increasingly disconnected from their own people and are too often um, accountable to a constituency of outsiders, really, who are um, sometimes too willing to back them at any price. That's the short version. <laughs> no, it's a, the longer version. You can buy the book tonight. <laughs> oh, you got to come on the road. You're good at this. <laughs> um, in the chapter Waldorf Astoria, which takes place in 2011, just after independence, we start to see things change between South Sudan and the US. Yeah. And what stands out was a fascinating story about President Obama. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so this is really a story that highlights that point about the changing relationship. And so President Salva Kiir um, has met George W. Bush three times in the Oval Office um, before he is the head of a country, right? Like his country doesn't exist yet. That's a lot of face time for anybody in the Oval Office, uh, no matter where you're from. So he's got this relationship um, with the previous administration. He has not yet met President Barack Obama. And this is August of 2000, or September of 2011, uh, just after South Sudan has become independent. And uh, he's going to meet President Obama, the man whose administration in many ways helped deliver uh, or safeguard and then deliver independence. So they come to New York City. And it's the annual meeting of the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, and there's a meeting at this famed hotel you all know on the Upper East Side of New York called the Waldorf Astoria. And Salva Kiir arrives with his entourage, and they make their way up to one of the upper floors. And the, the Waldorf Astoria is sort of transformed into the State Department uh, every year around the United Nations General Assembly. So I'm going to pause there and give you a little bit of context. At this point, just after independence, um, South Sudan has been for generations fighting to secede from the north, as we know. When they do, when South Sudan opts out uh, in many ways of, of Sudan's problems, those problems exist or, or continue in Sudan. And many of the sort of brothers in arms that have been fighting with the South Sudanese are marooned. They're, they're stuck inside a Sudan facing the same problems they have for generations. So um, nobody in South Sudan's um, ruling class or in the military wants to cut these guys off. And so um, they are funneling weapons across the border. South Sudanese are, are funneling weapons to these brothers in arms across what is now an international boundary into Sudan. And this is, as 
th this is at a very tense time when the negotiations over separation are still ongoing, and, and it's, it's really highly risky. And I was in Sudan at the time, and this is the worst kept secret in the region. Everyone knows these weapons are going across, um, including the administration, including Barack Obama, who's got satellite imagery of the weapons going across. So the Americans, before the meeting, meet with the South Sudanese delegation, and they say, we understand this, we understand the problem, we can work it out. Please don't lie to the president. Please don't lie to President Obama. We'll figure a way around this, but please don't lie to him. You know where this is going, right? <laughs> so they enter the room and they sit down and, and they uh, this big oval table and they, the uh, sort of pleasantries are exchanged and there's talk about uh, the achievement and the road ahead and it's kind of generally a light meeting until we get to the end and President Obama says something to the effect of, look, we know that you're sending weapons across the border and you're now a sovereign state and this is hugely risky and we've got the proof here um, and we really got to find a solution to this. And there's a pregnant pause just like right now. <laughs> There's a pregnant pause and everyone, all eyes fix on Salva Kiir, the man in the cowboy hat. And he's looking down and he thinks and, and he looks up slowly and looks at Obama across the table and says, Mr. President, if your satellites are telling you that we're sending weapons across the border, uh, you should probably check on your satellites. And I tell that story because it's a, in some ways kind of a, a signal of just how um, quickly the relationship changed, uh, and in some ways how um, interests had been mistaken for friendships. And that, that's a quote actually by um, a guy called Ambassador Princeton Lyman, um, who, to, to whom this book is dedicated. Um, so the, the relationship changes pretty quick. You're not gonna like this question, but um, you bring us inside the two-year peace process uh, to end the war, you do that in this book. But it begins with you flying into Juba as an American diplomat in the opening days of the war. Yes, take us back to that moment. Set the stage. So this is 2013 when the violence begins uh, and my boss, I'm then working as chief of staff to the US Special Envoy who sort of represents the State Department and the White House um, in terms of American diplomacy, they're kind of the front line. So he and I fly out to uh, South Sudan and this is just as the violence is beginning and no one really has any idea how bad it is. And so we pack our, I think we packed three day bags. Um, and I had, I had Christmas presents in the bag because we were gonna fly back, I was gonna fly back home to Minnesota direct from there. And we fly in and we meet with the President Salva Kiir. And based on this his, historical relationship with Washington, we're bringing a message, you've gotta put this back in a box. You've gotta find a way to stop the fighting, uh, to reconcile, to salvage this before your new nation comes undone. And we're using as much encouragement as we can, but also as much pressure. So we deliver the message, we hop on a plane, we fly back out and we're in neighboring Kenya in the, in the airport in Nairobi. And we're walking down the jetway to hop a flight back to the United States and our phone rings. And it's John Kerry, who's the Secretary of State. And John Kerry's back in Washington. And there's some folks here that remember this well. Um, John Kerry's back in Washington and the, the intelligence reports are coming in at the time and people are starting to understand just how bad it is and that young men like Simon and families like that are being really massacred in the streets of Juba. Um, and so uh, John Kerry says to my boss, go back. And so we turn around, walk up the jetway and go back and this begins a, a sort of process of shuttle diplomacy in which we played one small part along with many others from the region, many Africans and, and Europeans. Um, but we head home uh, with our three day bags for the first time nine weeks later. Um, and this is the start of the peace process um, that goes for the next several years. Um, and it was really uh, important. I mean, the stakes are high. This is a chance to, uh, to stop, not only stop the violence, to, but to sort of uh, reset in South Sudan and put in place some of the protections and some of the reforms that hopefully can give South Sudan a better chance. And um, this is a process uh, run by the region and run by the South Sudanese themselves, but we play a supporting role um, and it fails and we fail. Um, you know, despite attempts, I think, to make it a more inclusive process and bring South Sudanese voices into it um, that didn't have a say in their own government, um, that ultimately failed. And so, uh, unfortunately, um, there's a return to conflict two years later. But I, I do, there's a, there's a long way of answering your question, which is there, there are two or three chapters in the book on the peace, press, peace process itself, not because um, 
I'm convinced that that's going to stand the test of time 100 years from now um, in terms of its importance in a larger sense, but I think because it brings you really inside uh, the mechanics of South Sudan at that time, uh, you meet some of the personalities up close, and I think it uh, says a lot about South Sudan uh, past, present, and future. We look forward to the details in reading the book <laughs> yeah. when we leave tonight. Um, you write that after the war began and its devastating images were broadcast around the world, that a larger question ultimately rose to the surface. Everybody's wondering, did South Sudan's collapse mean independence was a mistake? Yeah, the billion dollar question. <laughs> Answer any, it, Any please. opinions in the audience? Uh, so in short, uh, no. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming out. No, um, I don't think South Sudan's independence was a mistake, and I argue with that in the book. And so um, when there is collapse, uh, uh, people start pointing fingers, and there's a bunch of gotcha journalism and says, ah, see United States and see others. This was such a huge mistake. Uh, you screwed this up. And I think that's, uh, I, thought, I think that was cheap, and I think that was misguided um, in that it failed to understand both the context and the likely alternatives to South Sudan's independence at that stage. So one is the context. Um, had the South Sudanese been denied that right to self-determination after fighting for it for uh, two or three generations, um, I argue uh, that, and, and many others do, um, that uh, a new and larger war with Sudan would have ensued, one now fueled by oil money and fueled by much bigger weapons and which could have engulfed the whole region. So that's the context. Um, and uh, the other bit is about self-determination itself. Um, this is a principle or a right that's been enshrined in the UN Charter since the end of the Second World War. And if you look at South Sudan's history of, uh, as I mentioned, of extreme uh, neglect, right? Denied services, denied a, a economic opportunity, denied uh, a right to be a citizen really in their own country. It's hard to find a place where there is a stronger argument for self-determination. So um, I don't think independence was a mistake. Um, I think the more pertinent critiques are those of expectations and of execution. And I think the question really that I hope I, I wrestle with in the book and, and we can talk about more is, uh, putting in place the foundations for a viable state. All right, one last question before I open it up to the audience. Um, it all sounds pretty grim of late, with the numbers of dead reportedly as high as 400,000, and so much suffering over the years. Yep, you end this book on a positive note of optimism. Tell us why. Uh, so I am optimistic about South Sudan, but it depends on your time horizon. Right, and I think we too often look at these things in two and four and six year terms when we should be thinking 10 and 15 and 25 year terms. Um, if you look at our own government right now, which finally exists again, I mean, how much gets done in one uh, session of Congress these days or in one presidential administration, right? So I think there is some perspective that is necessary here. Um, and there's another point I make in the book that if you really zoom out and think about this in broader terms and the formation of a state in South Sudan, um, it wasn't that long ago that this country, um, my own country, um, fought its own civil war to the tune of uh, three quarters of a million deaths uh, over identity, economy, uh, and the nature of our state. And so I, I do think there's some perspective that's important as we think about this. Um, but I am optimistic in the long term, and this goes back to the young man that I gave you a little intro, entry to, Kong, um, this guy that I met on my first visit to South Sudan, and he's extraordinary. He's remarkable, he's in his late 20s, he's got all sorts of ideas about uh, social cohesion and about uh, reconciliation at the local level and what kind of pay systems they need to put in place in his village and how that can translate to the state level and what they can do about roads and transportation. He's a remarkable figure. Um, and so I'm really impressed with him, and um, over those seven years, I don't have much contact with him, but he rises uh, in his community, and he ultimately um, is unfortunately embroiled in the polarization that exists today, but he's also playing a really important role in his community. Um, so I hop on a plane, and I, and a helicopter, and another helicopter, and I go out to this place called Wat to sit with Kong. And um, Kong is just as impressive as he was before, uh, but he's in a really difficult circumstance. Um, the war has so divided um, his society, and unfortunately, um, uh, the guys at the top are still there. And uh, the same thing that I talk about with Kong in 2009, we talk about uh, 
in 2017, and that is, um, I think, the most important ingredient of long-term prosperity in South Sudan, and that is generational change. So Kong is really remarkable. There are lots of people like Kong, young men and women all across South Sudan, um, who many of them, by the way, as I mentioned with Simon, grew up in neighboring uh, countries and refugee camps. And the silver lining of that was two things. They got an education that they otherwise would not have received back home in South Sudan. And they grew up alongside boys and girls from across the ethnic spectrum in South Sudan. They weren't isolated. And so they have different ideas. They have educations. They have different ideas about the future of their country. And they really want to take the reins. Right? And so um, they're in a tough spot right now. And, and Kong and I have a, a very personal conversation over the course of 48 hours. I mean, how convenient for me to drop in and hear Kong talk about this, but he's struggling. Does he stay and, and try to make a difference despite the circumstance, or does he go and, and take off and say, to hell with it, and you know, I'll, I'll leave for a, a better life elsewhere? So um, Kong does stay, and there's many others like him um, who he is, at the time, is keen to connect with, and I think uh, really are a source of genuine um, optimism for South Sudan in the long run. That's great to hear. Patience. That's all. Um, so thank you all for your questions. I want to uh, read a few that came in from the audience. Um, this is from Ethan. Is the Dinka Nuer ethnic divide I drank all my water. Um, a product of colonialism similar to the Hutus and Tutsis of Rwanda? Whoa. Uh, well, that's a tough. Say the first part again. Is, is, is the, are the ethnic divides in the country a product of colonialism? Oh, man. Um, I think we may need another night for this. Uh, thanks. Um, whoever asked that, I will buy a drink after and we can get into the weeds. But there, I mean, there are obviously issues um, of colonialism that are relevant in Sudan's long conflicts. You have this huge country that's largely ungovernable and it's so diverse and it doesn't make... There, there isn't a clear rationale for its borders. Um, the same is true in South Sudan and a, and a relatively uh, diverse society that unlike other, um, unlike many of the other British and other colonial societies, uh, isn't developed in the same way, doesn't have uh, the same institutions as sort of treated as a backwater. Um, so there are definitely there there is definitely a role of colonialism, not just in the divide between Dinka and Nuer, I think, but in the in the larger context. Um, there are there are a host of other issues. I think I think the more important thing to understand about Dinka and Nuer society and the, and the conflict that there is is the one I mentioned earlier that this wasn't simply a war between uh, uh, Muslims in the north and and you know black Christians in the south. It wasn't uh, it wasn't that geographical. It wasn't that easy. This was a this was a country that was governed from the center and many of its peripheries um, articulated the same uh, demands. Uh, and the same grievances that many in the South did, one, and two, uh, during that war in South Sudan, um, and I quote this in the book, um, that there are some who believe that actually in Sudan's long civil war, uh, more Southerners f died fighting each other than they did fighting against soldiers in the North, right? And so there was campaigns of divide and rule that happened, but also uh, local grievances that were uh, sort of uh, exacerbated or manipulated. And so there's this long history leading up to 2011 of, of um, division, uh, and many times on an ethnic basis. And as I mentioned, um, they are just starting to congeal. They're just starting to try and define what it means to be a nation. What is it? Uh, am I a Dinka first or am I a South Sudanese first? And that's just starting to happen. And those wounds are just starting to heal um, when this war breaks out. And as I mentioned, um, that sort of delicate social fabric is ripped open again. Okay, don't worry, you can't, you can't say it all in this time, but you can buy the book and <laughs> learn a lot more about these issues. Um, so from George, can you say more about the special relationship b between the US and South Sudan and when exactly did it begin? Um, well, exactly is tough, but the, the character that I mentioned, Dr. John Garang, um, he is leading this movement, this, this fledgling movement in South Sudan, the SPLM, and it has a sort of Marxist-Leninist flavor to it, um, and it's allied uh, with the Eastern Bloc. 
And I, I tell this story in the book, but in 1990 or 91, um, John Garang realizes that they're on the wrong side of history, uh, and he says, we got to hop on a plane and go to Washington. Uh, and so he does, and, and John Garang's this remarkable guy. He's got really um, impressive ideas about how to change Sudan, and he's very charismatic, as I mentioned. And he goes to uh, the Christian right, and he sells religious persecution and he gains supporters for his cause. And he goes to human rights groups and he sells human rights abuses. And he goes to the Congressional Black Caucus and other constituencies and he sells slavery. And over time, um, he builds this extraordinary constituency which includes um, members of Congress. So he doesn't make inroads with the administration right away at the time, um, but he realizes that there's staying power in Congress. And so he develops uh, allies, again, on the right and left, it's an extraordinary coalition. Um, and is able to shape this movement in their favor. And there's a larger conversation here about how this policy and how the United States posture develops in South Sudan. Um, and it's an interesting one, uh, but very briefly, it comes at this kind of nexus um, in American foreign policy between kind of humanitarian, human rights-oriented, principled-based foreign policy and a near complete lack of national security interest. And so in that space, uh, a small group of individuals, a handful of uh, people are able to shape a policy that really intensifies and endures over time in a way that I argue in the book would not have happened in China if it was China or if it was Russia or if it was Iran or if it was more serious places, right? Um, so he develops this remarkable relationship. He also, there's a story in the book, um, he goes to Midland, Texas, home of George W. Bush and, and Laura Bush and at the time, and he goes to two churches that morning, on a Sunday morning, uh, to win supporters for his cause. And there's one liberal church and one conservative church, and he's racing with his, with his, uh, his liaisons between the two ch churches, one conservative, one liberal, and he's changing the Bible verses uh, in the homily to suit the crowd that he's going to. So it's really this remarkable constituency that's built over time, and as I mentioned, it's a righteous cause. Um, but over time, I think um, we ultimately get too close to this movement um, that isn't fully reflective of South Sudanese society and has its own problems, uh, and I think therein uh, there are some seeds of uh, its ultimate undoing. So we have probably uh, time for one more question from the audience. And someone asked, can you speak on your background in foreign policy um, before you? I'm a dancer by <laughs> training. <laughs> um, so wh what did you do before? How did, how did you end up here? And um, you know, now yeah. and going forward, yeah, tell us I about your, po your background <laughs> in foreign policy. Uh, somebody missed this when, when, uh, when the intros were given. Um, I went to South Sudan first uh, for an organization called the International Crisis Group, um, which does research and conflict on, on uh, a host of uh, countries that are either in conflict or coming out of conflict and tries to really help international policymakers understand what's happening and give ideas about what should happen. So I'd worked uh, for that organization in New York and then I went to Sudan um, and I uh, was given great guidance by this gentleman right over here, Mr. David Mazursky, who is sort of my predecessor. You can wave, Dave. Who taught me lots of what I know about South Sudan. Um, and yeah, I then I, I left uh, for a year and then I wanted to go work in the Obama administration and, and Ambassador Lyman. Um, uh, was crucial in, in kind of bringing me into that. Uh, and I did not want to continue working on Sudan and South Sudan, but he talked me into it, and I think uh, I'm really grateful that he did. Um, is that enough? I, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you, Zach. I think I, so. Um, I think we might have one more question, um, and this is a good one for the audience, is asking, where should you go study African politics? What would be to learn more about this? What university? All the Bay Area universities. <laughs> uh, you should go to Africa, actually. Um, I mean, obviously, there's lots of great programs in this country and lots of interesting people doing interesting work. But I, I mean, I, I, I'm looking at the students here. Um, um, if you can swing it, if you can eat beans and rice, if you can find a way to do it, if this is what you're interested in, you should go there. Um, because you're going to learn more just showing up than you are at any university here. Um, you know, turn in your papers and do your work, but when you're done, um, yeah, I think there's a lot to be said about, and 
uh, learning in Africa and learning from Africans, um, you know, uh, again on, and I think that's that's related to this story. I think that wasn't done enough. I think uh, too often this story, Sudan's story, became about Westerners. Um, the whole story of Darfur, um, I think, became too much about Westerners. Um, so that'd be my advice: is is to go hop on a hop on a plane if you can scrape together the cash. Um, I just want to thank everyone, everyone for being here tonight, and on behalf of World Affairs, um, you know, thank you, Zach, for this enlightening discussion and um, for your participation. Thank you.